All right, welcome. My name is uh, Joyce Macbeth. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Geology at the University of Regina and an adjunct professor at the University of Saskatchewan in Geological Sciences. Now I would like to welcome Dr. John Pomroy of the Global um, Institute for Water Security to give some opening remarks on behalf of Global Water Futures, John. Hello. Uh, thank you very much. It's a great delight to be here and to uh, welcome Dr. Campbell to the University of Saskatchewan and to our water research in the area. Um, my name is John Pomeroy. I'm director of the Global Water Futures Program. And, the, uh, and it's uh, wonderful as we move forward this week with the beginning of the Distinguished Lecture Series that uh, we have Dr. Campbell to contribute to that. Uh, the um, Global Water Futures, the Global Institute for Water Security, Women Plus Water, and the College of Arts and Science Departments of Biology and Geological Sciences, it's quite a list, isn't it, are very pleased to sponsor today's talk. So that gives you uh, some idea of the breadth and the depth of interest there. Uh, uh, the talk is on the environment and history colliding, uh, the case of legacy gold, mining ta gold mine tailings in uh, Nova Scotia, Canada. The, um, and, and that... Uh, I find very interesting. It reminds me when I was young, I used to travel around northern Saskatchewan in the winter, as one can do, and occasionally come across, across an old mining settlement and community, and you'd almost invariably find it intact from when they abandoned it. So uh, this is not just a Nova Scotian phenomenon. It's important throughout the West and northern Canada. Um, so some background. What is Global Water Futures? It's a pan-Canadian research program funded by the Canada First Research Excellence Fund. It's the largest uh, water research program in the world run by universities. How many universities? Well, U of S, but with 17 others across the country. Uh, we fund over 200 professors uh, across the country and have uh, supported the uh, employment and research of over uh, 1,700 graduate students, uh, researchers, uh, technicians, engineers, and others. So. It's a, a truly phenomenal program, over 500 partners uh, across the country, and we have 65 projects and core teams, and I will not list them for you. So, uh, but some of them are very much involved and uh, perhaps of interest to, uh, to the research of Dr. Campbell. We have some looking at the effect of permafrost thaw in Northern Canada on release of uh, toxic uh, materials, uh, arsenic, uranium, uh, principally in them. We have some looking at the Yellowknife giant mine and the uh, mobility of metals associated with this. Uh, we have others looking at toxicology of uh, drinking water supplies, source waters, whether they be groundwater or surface water supplies. And it's a continuing uh, problem for us in Canada with our tremendous history of mining. Um, I'll, I'll just close with, uh, you wonder how long can this go on? Well, several years ago, I was a professor at the University of Wales and uh, used to take my students for environmental or science field trips to some of the mines in the Cambrian Mountains above Aberystwyth, lead mines established by the Romans that were still leaking contaminated, highly toxic uh, materials 2,000 years after their establishment. And it's hard to find the original Romans to get them to sort it out for us. So, uh, so they, uh, there's a, a tremendous uh, uh, research obligation and cleanup obligation across Canada with this area. So I'll see you there and uh, pass the microphone over to Dr. Joyce Macbeth, who will give us the territorial acknowledgement and introduce our guest lecturer properly. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Pomeroy. We're gathered here today on Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis and reaffirm our commitment to the process of reconciliation together. In light of the recent tragic events at James Smith, Cree Nation and Weldon, Saskatchewan, I'd like to invite you to take a few moments of silence together in memory of those who had died and uh, in solidarity with their families, friends and the community. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Linda Campbell. Linda is a professor at St. Mary's University in Nova Scotia in the Department of Environmental Science. The focus of her research is on aquatic ecosystem health, 
including the impact and fate of toxicants and human interactions with aquatic inter ecosystems. Recently, Linda and her research team began a study of remediation of historic gold mine tailings in wetlands in Nova Scotia, and I'm fortunate enough to be involved in that project as a collaborator. Dr. Campbell is originally from Edmonton, Alberta. Welcome, Dr. Campbell. Thank you so much. Thank you, and good afternoon, everybody, for coming. I'm very thrilled to be here to, as Dr. Palmer was mentioning, uh, really this is a pan-Canada problem. It's not just isolated in Nova Scotia. The past is still rearing its ugly head and pro having problems uh, today. So in many, many parts of the world for thousands of years, as you mentioned. Luckily in Nova Scotia, it's not that long of a historical problem, but is still a problem that we need to deal with today. Here is an image of one of our sites that we go to often, and it's called Muddy Pond. And if you look at the image, you think, wow, that's quite a lovely place. I would enjoy to go canoeing there or something like that. And in the corner on the left-hand side, you see three people standing. There are two students that were within my team and one good colleague of mine, Dr. Michael Parsons. And so again, isn't this a lovely scenic, you know, uh, picturesque image of Nova Scotia? Well, right down here at the forefront of the image, that gray material that you're seeing, that's tailings. And the tailings have impacted. And you can actually see where the tailings stop and where the green becomes more green. And then also listed on this slide is other individuals involved in the research teams, whether in our dear internal SMU group or externally. And to give you a snapshot of how challenging the, this issue is, it's not just myself or just one or two people of a team figuring this out. No, we really are collaborating and working together on this complex issue. And so as I go through the presentation today, I'm not going to go through each and every of our projects. I've picked out a select few to start the conversation with you all. And I will also add our website is here listed on the slide. And at the end of the presentation, if you want to write that down, it will be listed again. And well, important things first, I'm honored to be here. And I'm here in Treaty 6, Ms. Saskatoonina. And the people in time of memoriam that have been here, beautiful land that, and I'm very welcome and I guest here, so thank you. And I did come from Nova Scotia, which only recently experienced our own mass murdering event in port pic and we are still recovering from that tragedy. And so I do feel very much for the people who went through that in the James Smith Cree Nation and the village of Weldon, I feel for you. And so our research is in the land of Mi'kma'ki. Our university is in Jibuktuk. And our research, as you can see from our map on the far right, is in different districts of Mi'kma'ki. And we're all working under the Treaty of 1725, which was ratified by the Crown and the Mi'kmaq community of peace and friendship for all of us. And so we are all treaty people. For my research, I'm conscious and I do consciously try to include the Indigenous and Mi'kmaq names of where we're working. This lecture, though, is one exception to that because the practice of gold mining was a colonial act. And so I will be using the colonial names to demonstrate that it was a colonial practice of that time. And thank you, everybody, Dr. Joyce Macbeth, Dr. Britt Hall from the University of Regina, who made this trip happen, and all of the other partners who, again, made this a successful uh, trip. Thank you very much.
All right, so who are we? I would like to introduce my team. A lot of the sl slides that I'll be showing you are contributed by the various members of the research team. And so like saying it's my talk and it's just me, absolutely not. It is certainly a team effort. There are two co-leads that work together in our research team. And so I mostly focus on the ecology, the biomagnification, bioaccumulation in the field. And then we have Dr. Emily Chapman and she works on the ecotoxicology side of things and remediation of the tailings. And so we work in tandem together very closely to manage the team, which is a very interdisciplinary team and we have many methodological approaches. And just to say too, we are recruiting. And so I have more information at the end of the slide, but keep that in mind. And these are the current members of our research team. The team in yellow here in the center are funded by a mining corporation, Atlantic Gold. And we also have an NSERC Alliant that is matching funding. So thank you so much that we do have a nice pot of money to be able to do the research. And here on the right are other members of the team who do very interdisciplinary work, but it's funded from other sources. And so as we go through the presentation, I will mention them by name and identify their projects that they were involved in. And unfortunately, I'm not able to talk about all their projects. I would need to probably teach an entire course in the entire semester or two, and I don't think I'm here for that long. So, um, but maybe one day, maybe one day. All right, so let's give some context to gold in Nova Scotia. How many of you are familiar with the geology of Nova Scotia? Looking at a show of hands in the room, okay. We're a small province, but we're quite diverse geologically speaking. And we're the, uh, we're to us. The Maguma train collided. And at the top, we have the Avalon train. And where the gold is found is typically in the part of the Maguma train. There's two formations. We have the Golden Bill formation, and then we have the Halifax formation. So that's typically where the gold is found. And there are three types of deposits, typically in Nova Scotia. And then we have this really gorgeous picture that we can actually show all three types in one. So we do have high grade, and that's in the quartz veins. And the picture to the left is just that small fleck of gold within the quartz. And then we have low grade gold. And then we also have metastan sandstone and slate. A lot of the high grade gold, high quality gold was mined in the 1800s into the early 1900s and it's been depleted. So now the low grade gold is what is being focused on. Almost all of that high grade gold has already been processed historically. And then history of mining in Nova Scotia as well. This is an image, a graph that was taken from a report published in 2012 that Dr. Michael Parsons that I mentioned earlier collaborated on and led, a very good collaborator of our teams. And it shows the gold production versus the years here from 1860s um, into the early 2000s. There were three gold rushes in Nova Scotia. California and North Carolina were the original sources of that gold fever and gold rush. And once you found that gold there, gold fever just hit, uh, spread globally. And that was part of the colonial action of colonizing these various countries. So the three rushes would include various diverse groups of people that came from all over the world to Nova Scotia. And you can see the high grade gold and the production and that was taken from that high grade quartz. And the first peak here, 1860s, I think it was actually in 1863 to 1867. 
and then just before the 1880s. And then another large peak in the 1880s to 1910s or so. There was one more just before World War II as well. And this is reported, and I want to emphasize the word reported. Gold mining was very well regulated in terms for reported, but it was 1.2 million troy ounces of gold. And that's pretty, you know, that's pretty small. And when we look at Nova Scotia, but for us, that was very profitable as a business endeavor. I think the, you know, you think of gold mining, it wasn't just the action of gold mining, but was the economic standing around that business. And so this was published in 1868, just after that first discovery of gold in Nova Scotia. This manual was $1. That's a lot of money at that time. And here are some images from the historical sites and some historical practices that took place in Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia was actually in compressed anticlines, and so it had this flow to it. And so most of the gold was found at that top part of the anticline. And it's not, they didn't do a lot of shaft mining historically. Surface mining was more common. There were some shafts, but again, surface mining was more common. A lot of towns and roads that were built at that time are still there, and it's part of our legacy in the province. And so why are mercury and arsenic some issues? So we have an image here of arsenal pyrite at the top. You know, part, mostly it's not really that thick, but it's just a really pretty picture to illustrate the point. And at the bottom, we have mercury. And so both elements are of concern to us. Arsenal pyrite is naturally found in the ore, geologically speaking. And then mercury was imported to Nova Scotia from the States to do the amalgamation process. And so the process looked like often they would use a stamp mill. There's other techniques as well. There's ball mills or others, but typically, again, it was stamp mills. This is a five stamp mill battery. And what they would do is have the ore that was mined and they would crush the ore by hand into smaller chunks. And then they would feed those smaller chunks into the stamp mill and it would become a very fine powder. And let me just pause for one quick second. I'm just making sure the sound check, everybody's able to hear the interpreter okay in the room and in Zoom. Okay, great, perfect, thank you. And so they pounded that ore into a very, very fine material. And then there are copper plates next in the line and they were coated with a very thin layer of mercury. And then those tables were shaked and the water would flow over top of them and it would move the powder material across the top of that copper plate. And then the gold was amalgamed and sucked with that mercury and it would be kept going and flushed all the way through. And so when we're looking at this, what is the most important thing that's needed? What makes this work and operate? Water specifically fresh water, they couldn't do this process without access to water. So, so hold that in mind, the importance of water. And so they would be moving this material over the copper plates. Unfortunately, these poor gentlemen had no PPE at all at that time, but they would actually be scraping those copper plates and mercury and putting the amalgam into a amalgam plate that's listed here. And then they would put that into a retort and heat it. And this is an actual retort that was used in Nova Scotia. And what they would do is capture the mercury from um, during that process and what was left was gold. And then they could refine that into gold. Hopefully they would use that captured mercury again for their future practices. And really the mercury that was used here depends on the skills of the workers. And so if there was a new corporation, new organization that were not trained, the staff weren't sure what to do, they lost a lot of mercury in this process. 
But if they were maybe quite, uh, you know, uh, proficient and mercury was expensive and they needed quite a lot of it. So you would want to recover a lot of it. But those people that were proficient in doing this practice, they could reduce the amount of mercury that was lost through the amalgamation process. Okay, so remember, we were talking about tailings and we mentioned that water was vital. So hold that, it will come up again. So a little bit more about mercury. This is an old newspaper that was published during the gold rush period. I'm trying to just check the year, the first gold rush. Mm -hmm. It's just a back of a classified ads. And, you know, I'm taking a look through just look at the cost of things, what they were buying. Oh, that's so cheap compared to now. But one word really struck out to me when I was looking at this. Quicksilver is an old word for mercury. So this is an ad from one newspaper, one town, advertising the sale of 800 pounds of mercury. You know, that is not a drop in the bucket, quite literally. And it's been estimated that there is a one-to-one -one ratio for mercury usage of the gold amalgamation to gold being there. But again, that depends on the skill level of the individuals doing that milling process. And then if we maybe look at giant mine or some other areas, this doesn't seem like a lot of mercury when we look at them by scale. However, there was a project done in the experimental lake areas in Northwest Ontario. And they were looking at how mercury would contaminate a system. And they used mercury isotope to track the mercury into the system. And they found just a portion of a teaspoon contaminated the entire lake for several years. That's less than a teaspoon. And now we're talking about 800 pounds. So even one drop of, that's more than a teaspoon. <laughs> And so it certainly is worrisome. This is from Dr. Parsons' report, uh, again, bringing highlight to their work. There are two graphs that are showing arsenic and mercury concentrations from 14 sites across Nova Scotia that they studied. And at the bottom here is the abbreviations of the various sites. And then we're looking at the scale and we have green for arsenic on the left and silver for the mercury. And the dash line is the Canadian Council of Ministers of Environment guidelines. We have sediment and soil quality guidelines for arsenic and then for mercury. And so when we're looking at the arsenic side, all 14 sites, the range of arsenic varies. It depends, of course, on the meteorologically, uh, speaking of the geology, but almost all of them, well, you know, all of them are above the CCME guidelines. You know, it's a big challenge, right, that we're dealing with. And then when we're looking at mercury, there is variability, and it, again, goes back to how long did the corporations use mercury? What was the skill of the a uh, team that was working there, when did they switch to cyanidation for amalgamation? And so we do see more variability here on the mercury side. But at first you look at it, oh, well, it's just below the soil quality guidelines, okay. And, you know, sediment, but people are assuming then that mercury is less of a risk to the environment. However, please do keep in mind that the CCME guidelines are based on direct toxicity not for chronic exposure or accumulation, only direct toxicity. For arsenic, we're more worried about the direct toxicity. But for mercury, we worry about bioaccumulation. Arsenic really does not bioaccumulate, but mercury does for sure. And so these numbers are worrisome. And this is not factoring in the bioaccumulation. So have I alarmed anybody yet? Okay, good. Okay, so when we were looking at this uh, slide that's on the left previously, we were talking about water, thinking about where it comes from, and then think, okay, so the tailing materials with the water left over, where do you think they put that? 
Do you think they put it in a nice barrel and contained it and disposed of it properly? No. And so in the right image, this is all tailings. And this is where the processing mill took place in the background of the image and the foreground is complete tailings. Those tailings are still there. So typically low lying areas, wetlands are holding these tailings. Dr. Chapman prepared this slide and to really just illustrate the scope of the problem that we're faced with. There were 360 mines in Nova Scotia within 64 gold districts. And not every mine produced tailings because some of times they would ship off their ore into more centralized locations for processing. But let's say over 300 probably do have tailings associated with them. And not all of those are mapped accurately. And so that's one level of an issue that we have to deal with is finding where they are. And then the next problem is, okay, many of them are high in arsenic and mercury concentrations. Not all of them, but many of them are. But then how many? We're not sure. We do have very good data for the 14 sites that Dr. Parsons dealt with and our sites that we have researched. So we're good there. It's well quantified. But then you have to think, the lab analysis costs, hmm, if you're going to be paying um, 20 to $1,000 per sample, depending on what you're going to want analyzed, you know, and so forth, the scope of the problem just keeps expanding and expanding. And all of the questions that are listed here when we're looking at our gaps in knowledge, Emily has narrowed it down to these few, um, you know, where are the tailings? They're moving downstream, but where? The human and ecological risk of having these tailings. And right now we're not able to answer those questions directly. We do have evidence, but we need to build more information to have this complete scope. And this is one of our study sites here. And you can see how shallow our wetlands are in Nova Scotia. And that's another scope of the problem that we're faced with as well. And you think, well, okay, let's just find, solve the problem and move on. You know, assume all the tailings are contaminated and move on. But the problem is arsenic and mercury have very different chemistry. So with arsenic, we're more worried about the redox and speciation of arsenic. When it becomes arsenic-3 and arsenic-5, those are the more toxic forms of arsenic and those are worrisome. And they're quite complex when you're looking at the redox cycle. And it's very useful to follow the iron when you're following these because they do just go along in parallel. But arsenic does not bioaccumulate and magnify as much depending on the situation. And then we're looking at mercury here on the right we're more worried about the methyl mercury, and that's more toxic and it bioaccumulates like crazy. And it's the most toxic form of mercury as well. And so the chemistries are very different. And this slide, man, I could put that into an entire environmental course for students to go into this, but we do need to understand the variation of these two to be able to manage the problem. So we're not studying all 300 mines. Uh, nope, that's not gonna happen. You know, there's only a team of what, seven people? No, that's, that's not going to happen. But the stars are where the largest mining practices took place. And we are focused on two of those. They're close to Halifax within an hour's distance, which is pretty nice for us. <laughs> And then there's several sites that we'll go to and sample depending on the project needs. And there's two modern mines in Nova Scotia right now that have set up practice. Their practices are different from the historical practices. 
And you're like, oh yeah, sure, of course, yes. But within uh, you know public domains, that's not always easily understood. And so I do need to emphasize the point that the modern and historical practices are very different. One thing though is where they do overlap is where the gold was historically, the gold is still there now today. And so the modern practices and the modern corporations are dealing with the legacy of the historical mining. So don't worry, I'm not going to go through each and every one of these pieces, but the point is that we have a lot of projects and we're very interdisciplinary. And so this is just a taste of a couple of the projects that we're working on. Some are completed, some are ongoing, and then some are our future endeavors. I'm only going to talk about a few of these and it's important uh, in context of where the contaminants are that I can go into those projects. First of all, quick personal story. The first time that I was walking out in the woods, looking for tailings, I didn't know the scope, the problem, anything, but the team and I, we decided, eh, we're just curious, let's go out into the woods. I had just moved to Nova Scotia at that time and I'm walking around and I'm arriving at this wetland. Like, oh, hmm, this uh, wetland, it's suffering. There's not really good growth going on. You know, there's green stuff, but it's not looking super healthy. My colleague, who's a geologist, took a shovel and was like, this is all tailings. And so that hole that my colleague dug has been there for six years before it, you know, was not like before it recovered. It took six years for one hole that was dug to recover. And then second of all, oh, I'll find more literature. Of course, I'll, you know, I'm going to go ahead and I'll do my readings and find the, the problem. Yeah. I did have a master's pro student at the time who accepted this, and that was Molly LeBlanc. And she did a review of the literature for gold mining impacts in Nova Scotia. It's, you know, a small uh, selection here, but it's not enough to be able to understand the problem. However, for fish, it appears well represented, you know, like comparatively, but a lot of the publications just reported one or two fish. Sometimes they don't even give you the fish species name or, you know, they just sort of say the mercury concentrations for a fish, but they don't tell you where. A lot of the older reports don't have the detail, just they happen to find a fish. They happen to, you know, hey, let's see what's there. It was later that it became more standardized and more consistent in approaches for sampling. So we can't use those older resources to understand the freshwater system and the impacts. Really, it was incredibly lacking in information. And it's ironic because the corporations needed water to process the ore. And then they're putting that water that they've processed and tailings back into freshwater, but it's not well studied. So, okay. You know, and I guess I found out why. So it is a huge problem. And then having to make a decision of what to do with that data. But I will add as well that the Queen's University and the Royal Military College have done some fabulous series of studies on terrestrial and marine impacted locations, but freshwater definitely lacking. But now we're responding to that uh, gap in knowledge by the work that we're doing. And so this is where we come in. One of the questions that we asked initially is, well, are the organis organisms accumulating mercury and arsenic? You know, they look fine. Are they accumulating this? So, okay, that is our first research question that we wanted to explore. Molly LeBlanc went to five locations that had been impacted by tailings and then two reference sites. The references on the far left. And she sampled quite an array of aquatic invertebrates and did analysis on mercury. She spent hours in the lab, commendable <laughs> the amount of time she spent there. And the mercury is elevated in invertebrates compared to the reference site. And this is, there's, well, there's no guideline for invertebrates. So we had to use the freshwater market guidelines for the sale of fish. So if a fish has mercury above this guideline, you cannot legally sell that to market. And it's 3.5 ppm. 
And so you can see all of the invertebrates are very clearly above that guideline, except for the reference site. So what are happening when things are eating these invertebrates? It's accumulating. And if you're looking here at OS on the very right, the very top are the predatory invertebrates. That's why they're the highest in mercury concentration. And then the closer to the red line are lower trophic position invertebrates. So bioaccumulation is yes happening. For arsenic now, arsenic does not bioaccumulate biomagnify, uh, sorry, but it does bioaccumulate. So it's hard to do analysis of arsenic because it does require more sample mass than others. So we couldn't analyze as much as we wanted. So we did select a few of our study sites and invertebrates to see how much arsenic was there. And we're seeing 250 to over 750 ppm. This is elevated. And so then we're looking at what is the health guidelines for any type of market value. 3.5 ppm. And these numbers are so high, we're not even able to put a red line anywhere. You wouldn't see it. And so, yes, invertebrates are accumulating arsenic as well. And then the next question we asked ourselves, is arsenic and mercury leaving the system through emergent insects that are leaving these systems? And so we sampled dragonflies throughout their entire life cycle. We captured the nymphs, the juveniles. We also trapped the adults as they emerged. And then as well as the casings. And we analyzed each of them to see the mercury and arsenic throughout the life cycle. This was a challenging part of the project. You know, we don't, when dragonflies emerge, you know, and we're just like, where and when are they going to do this? Hopefully we put the trap in the right spot and we'll catch a couple of dragonflies. You know, so far, so good. This is an infographic summary of the results of her project. And this is how much mercury and arsenic in each stage. So we have the aquatic larvae compared with the adults and compared with casings. So 7% of arsenic from the nymph is found within the adults. And then for mercury, we're looking at 86% is remaining within the adults. So good news for arsenic, right? But then, okay, we have a math. Whoever has a calculator, maybe. Um, we're talking about the numbers of what it was, 200 to 700 ppm of arsenic. So what's 7% of that? Is it below the 3.5 ppm? No, 7% is still incredibly elevated. It's a big number. Birds, fish, spiders, frogs, they all eat these invertebrates, both in the juvenile and adult stages. And so we're wondering what about the um, air and the uh, evaporation and the movement of that dust of the tailings. And so this is another master student, Michael Smith, who collected lichen right across a tailings area. And he did a transect of every 100 meters and collected lichen from a tree. He was in the woods uh, for quite some time and he made a grid based on that. And you can see that here and did see that mercury is a very good indicator for mercury, uh, for tailing hotspots. I'm showing you for mercury here, but we do have the data for arsenic as well. So there's two hotspots indicated here from the lichen, and they also happen to be the same sites of the older stamp mills. And that is where the amalgamation took place. They are still emitting mercury. And then we're also looking at the mercury and arsenic moving in pore water. 
And so we're looking at a beached area that is mostly dry, a semi-submerged location farther out, and then a fully submerged location. And we want to see if mercury and arsenic is changing seasonally. And we did find in the summer, it's dry. There was nothing that we could sample at the surface. That's a gap there. There was just nothing we could pull out of the um, samplers. But we noticed in the spring, dissolved mercury and dissolved arsenic is higher. And it's increasing at the surface in the fall. And so that means arsenic and iron become more mobile through those seasons. So how do you remediate that? How do you approach it? We're also looking at the proportion of arsenic-3 and arsenic-5. Arsenic is lower in the summer, but the proportion of arsenic-5 is higher. So even if in summer, the risk is, you know, appearing to be lower the, in total, it's becoming arsenic-5, and that is the species that we're most concerned about. It's quite complicated. <laughs> Let me just go back. Um, so he here, we're really at a point of, we're looking at mercury and arsenic. Yes, it's bioaccumulating. We look at that in the system. It's leaving the system through emergent insects. And it's hard to model or predict the changes of mercury and arsenic based on just one sampling time. And so all of these pieces, it's just very challenging to develop any models. David Lewis is an important member for you because he is part of the Create to Inspire program. And he has decided to face this challenge, let's say. Good for him. <laughs> and so he will be developing a column experiment. And he is going to be taking sediment cores and bringing them back to the lab and will be inserting different sensors and probes into it to measure arsenic, mercury, pH, redox, and so forth. Some of the treatments will be put onto our columns to reduce the mobility of arsenic and mercury. And some of them will have no treatments placed on them. And some we will dry out and then re-wetten. Re um, and some we will leave wet throughout the year. And so for one year, these columns will be monitored and hopefully we'll have some good results from that. And you can invite him here to give a talk. And so this is what a core looks like here. And so this is pre-tailing material. This is tailings, that thick, light section. And this is the current accumulation of organic matter. And just to give you a taste of the projects that are coming, of how we're going to be approaching these issues. And so I think we can all agree, mm, it's, there's probably a risk here. Would any of you disagree with that statement? I, I would love to listen, absolutely, if you disagree with that statement. But the risks are hard to qualify because we don't understand yet fully all of the myriad of uh, prongs that we have to look at. So Dr. Emily Chapman is leading the remediation project in the lab and trying to treat the wetlands in situ. And so for wetlands, typically there are two approaches that are done and both are fine. One is to dredge the wetlands. But the challenge with dredging is all of the arsenic that is in these wetlands becomes exposed to the air. And then it becomes arsenic-5, arsenic-3. And, uh, you know, where does that then go? And then the other traditional approach is to do a very th thick, passive layer of capping. But you did see in a previous image how shallow our wetlands are in Nova Scotia. So if we were to do that traditional capping method, we would lose our wetlands. And then so how would we replace those wetlands will be very, very difficult to do. And so Emily's approach is to be looking at a reactive amendment 
and a protective capping material. So we're shortening that to RAPC. And so we're looking at a very thin layer of reactive amendment that could be applied to wetlands in situ to encourage a natural recovery and growth. And so I can describe what we have been doing to date in the various phases of how we got here. And then at the end, I'll be talking about a very large project that uh, we're looking to recruit some very wonderful students to be a part of. So. And so this is one of our wetland sites that we study. It doesn't look very happy, does it? And so this is, again, one of the reasons we focus on this. And there's a stream at the back here, a little brook. And you know what's so funny? Right over here is our reference site. Because the stream is going uh, from left to right. And it's a very clean reference site just upstream. And so what we're looking at initially was nano zero valent iron, but it's too reactive. And so now we're looking at micro zero valent iron or a regular zero valent iron, and we're testing all three of them. And we're combining those with zeolite in different recipes. And we're developing treatments for that protective uh, capping and reactive amendment. I'm sorry, that little uh, talking thing is blocking part of the slide here, but we have our capping and a little bit there you can see, which is black, which is the reactive amendment, and then our contaminated tailings below. And for two years now, we've been going through a round of testings and we're narrowing down our uh, possible recipes to use. And so our tests were done in beakers. The lab was full of beakers, entirely full everywhere. We were testing each and every approach that we could think of. And then we would add invertebrates to the beakers to see the toxicology and the accumulation to those invertebrates. And this is Dr. Emily Chapman uh, here. She's always busy in the lab, always, or at the computer. <laughs> Emily prepared this slide, don't worry. There's a lot of information here, it's okay. But really you're looking at this thinking it's a lot. We have way more data behind the scenes because again, we had so many beakers and so many experiments. So we'll talk firstly in the top left and we were testing to see if the treatment itself was safe to use with the organisms. We exposed two sensitive species, we had Daphne and Hyalella, to the treatment itself. And it showed that, no, they survived very well in our treatment with and without the sale, uh, with and without it. But if we put them in with the tailings without any treatment, they died in, almost instantaneously. They did not survive very long. The tailings are just too toxic for them to survive. And so, yeah, no, immediately gone. And then the next question we asked, which is shown at the bottom left, is the bioaccumulation of it. We exposed crayfish, which are about this big, a miniature crayfish crayfish species, very small, and shrimp. And so both of those organisms stay close to the sediment. And so we're looking to see if the treatment reduced accumulation to these two organisms. And yes, we are able to show that. So this is great. We're so excited. Great. We're getting there. And then we came to the challenge that's on the right here. Because of the cost of lab analysis, we weren't able to do all of the treatments and replicates that we would initially want. Unfortunately, our stats are not showing here. Like, you know, it's not being shown either way. We just didn't have the replicates that we needed. Uh, just, you know, and it's unfortunate we're not able to see the mercury and arsenic. But the good news is, is that we know where to zoom in on. And so we will continue and do more testings on this with more replicates because now we know what we're looking for. And if you'd like to go through all of the graphs and so forth, certainly invite Emily. She will be happy to give a talk and she is a great presenter and she can go into every detail. And so we went from beakers, you know, this overwhelmed by beaker data, which was awesome. And now we're scaling up. And we wanted to expose all of the organisms simultaneously, which is more ecologically realistic. And so we're now we're using buckets for mesocosm experiments. And so there's different treatments listed here. 
and looking at replicates, we have two contaminated sites illustrated. And we have a very wonderful flow through system for our experiment. And we're looking at different species of plants, animals, and vertebrates. <laughs> and one person specifically I'd like to acknowledge for their work in the team. This is Liam Hill. He's a summer intern and now working with us throughout the fall. He was the one who worked and tested and you know fiddled and tweaked every piece of this system. And he is also the one that monitors the system to make sure it is continually working. If any of you have worked on a flow through system before, you can appreciate the, the lot of patience that is needed to be able to develop and maintain this. So Mendel Liam, and he will be presenting actually his work at a conference in November. In November. These are the species that we're using in our buckets. So we have two tolerant species and one incredibly sensitive species because we want to be able to in situ reintegrate and plant plugs into the wetlands to make sure that the material then can be worked with these sensitive species. And so pickerel weed, we in put into the untreated tailings and right away they wilted. They were not happy plants. But the ones that we included into the treated buckets and the control buckets, yeah, they looked a lot better. So right away, we can see visibly that evidence of change. And so we're really excited about that. And then we have local species of Anisoptera. So damselflies and drag dragonflies which are great study species and they're collected locally, but the problem is they emerge. As you saw in the first part of my talk, they're emerging and then going, you know, oh, what do we have left to analyze if you've emerged out of, the, out of the tailings? And so we've added another species that we used in the beaker test previously to our bucket test. They don't emerge, thankfully, <laughs> and they're a pretty tough organism, but, we're not able to use this for the next stage of our outdoor mesocosm work because these are very invasive species. I think in Poland or Hungary, they've now banned it. It is an invasive species. You're no longer able to import it. And so this is our species that bridges between the beaker and the bucket um, phases of our experiment. And we've had quite a busy summer. And then the next thing we're also studying is non-biologic material. And so we're using DGTs and we'll be inserting those for a week and looking at how much mercury and arsenic is absorbed in to the DGTs from the sediment. And then we'll also be doing microcores. And we're looking at the redox from the top to the bottom. Very same idea as when you're doing a field core for paleolimnology. We're just doing it on a smaller scale and doing baby, scale, baby cores and looking for that redox change from the amendment to the bottom of the sediment to the anoxic layer of the sediment. And these two people are working together on it. So we have David Lewis and Jenna Campbell. All right, so all of that, we will be closing our bucket experiment very soon. Uh, we'll be closing that and Please don't email me during that time when we're taking everything down afterwards. Absolutely, please do, but not during. And we do plan with the buckets, and then we will be using that data to determine and design our field mesocosm that we'll be installing next year. This is not ours. This is just a Google image uh, just to show something what it could look like. And we'll be dividing it into quarters and testing different treatments in those quarters. And we will also have the same plants that we are using now in our buckets, our same damsel and dragonflies. And uh, we're working right now through Animal Care Committee for paperwork to hope add one or two vertebrate species to our experiment as well, either killifish or tadpoles. We need people. So, and it's a super exciting project with a wonderful team. If you're interested about learning more, if you know of somebody else that you think might be interested, we are open and welcome to those discussions. And this is a thank you to everybody. As I said at the beginning of my talk, 
it's not just me or two, three people. It's impossible to do this level of work. We include Joyce and we have lots of other people who work in our interdisciplinary research. And of course, the funders, of course, listed at the bottom. And I did just want to add one more thing since I happen to be in Saskatchewan. A wonderful collaboration with the Canadian Light Source. And uh, you see, with somebody here from there, and we're working with uh, Dr. Corbis for some fish scale analysis of the distribution of contaminants. And I will be sending some uh, contaminated fish samples to you soon. Uh, so we'll see. In the future, we'll have an update on this. All right, in conclusion of my talk, here is some final information. I'm open to questions and discussion. If you're interested in learning more, here's the link to our website. You can jot that down. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Campbell. All right. So um, we have some time for questions. If any have come in through Zoom, Andrea will coordinate that and I'll coordinate ones from in the room. And I see Graham George, <laughs> Professor Graham George already has his hand in the air, tell surprise. Dr. George, your question. I'm just going to repeat that for the sake of people on Zoom, except I'm going to paraphrase. <laughs> so Dr. Um, Dr. George asked about the form of arsenic and um, speciation of arsenic within the um, organisms and whether that was something that Dr. Campbell was looking at since the amount of uh, the cutoff for 3.5 of 3.5 ppm was that what it was anyway for seafood okay anyway so curious curious about about the um speciation thank you that's a very important question to ask and that's part of the challenge when we're analyzing arsenic and the complexity of the chemistry that presents to us we have organic arsenic arsenic three arsenic five so that guideline was taken from Health Canada, a document of theirs. And so if you're interested in the references, I'm certainly happy to send those uh, your way. And I'm not saying, and I'm not recommending, and there's no recommendations here in terms of management on total arsenic values to the system, but it does propose really things that are important to talk about. Arsenic is elevated, and we do have reference sites that are, we're looking at, and our contaminated sites are way above our reference site. I don't have that in my slides, but we do have that data and we have shown that. And then secondly, that time when we started the project and this program, we needed something to compare it to. Is it high? Is it low? And so that was a good guideline to demonstrate that there may be something that we need to start considering here. And that was at the beginning of our work on this issue. And we needed to have something to say in council, we need to start looking at this. And it was a good thing that we did that because the data that we have shows and it helped develop the program, getting the funding that we now have and investigating it 
in more lines of evidence. And now we're looking at the speciation and that's very expensive when we're looking at analysis, but that is what we're looking at next more closely. We do want to see organic arsenic, arsenic three, arsenic five, you know, that is what we were looking for as part of our ecotoxicology phase of our analysis. However, but I still agree. Yes, it, it's high, you know, ho however you do it, it's higher than our reference sites. So I don't think we can disagree on that. But I would also agree as well that this merits more investigation. This <laughs> was the first set of data that we had and looking at the biodiversity and the range of invertebrates. That was the first data collected from tailing and contaminated sites. So it was a good first step for us and for everybody who's worrying about managing these tailings. Yeah. But absolutely, that's the court and next avenue. And the synchrotron's an awesome tool to explore that speciation as well. So lots of room for discussion on that, I'm sure, in the future. Um, Andrea, oh, thank you again for your question. Um, Andrea, anything from the audience on Zoom? Zoom questions. So okay. If anyone else, <laughs> let's mix it up a bit. We'll come back to Dr. George in a minute. Um, Dr. Lindsay. So I'll just repeat that for the sake of any Zoom participants. So Dr. Lindsay asked about how climate change might impact the efficacy of the amendments as they're used and fluctuations in the water table levels and how that might impact things. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there's several challenges that we have to look at. So there's lacking in data and we're building that data set right now. We're filling in that gap, but we do suspect, yes, that climate change will be something to consider when we're looking in the summer in that drier beached area. But when it becomes flooded with water, we are seeing an increase in arsenic and iron and then soon, Mercury, we were just waiting for the lab results of that. I was hoping I'd have it for today, but unfortunately didn't get it back in time. But we would expect to see that as well. And so that has led us to doing this column experiment where we're really focusing in on that specific question and understanding the chemistry better and the potential impacts going forward. It's easier to do that in the lab. And because we found when we go to the field in the winter, and try to get pour water out of the samplers from a frozen wetland, it's a bit of a challenge to do. You know, I was impressed that the team was actually able to get any water out of the samplers, but the columns will help us answer those questions and provide the data that we need to model that. And so I would suggest to you to consider invited, uh, inviting David Lewis maybe in two or three years when he's in through his PhD, and he will wow you with the level of uh, data that he'll have. Sounds good. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Pomeroy. Sorry. Yes. I'm <laughs> so, uh, or I guess you're next to the microphone, so it should have picked it up. Oh, it may not have been on. Okay. So Dr. Pomeroy's question was about <laughs> the impact of wildfires on mercury release and whether that might um, impact results. But close enough. Sorry. <laughs> Fabulous question. We're not planning to burn our sites yet, but... Uh, but thankfully, we don't have the same magnitude of 
uh, wildfires in Nova Scotia that are present in the west of Canada. We do, though, still have a high risk of fires in the summer when we do become dry. But I would expect that there would be a release of mercury after a fire takes place, and that's what you would see in Western Canada, typically. For arsenic, it's a different story, because how would the fire, you know, it's cooking the arsenic. And then what happens to that going forward? Mm -hmm. Yeah, something we would certainly need to talk about. To a stressed ecosystem, the trees are not... Um, they're not really resilient in these systems. And so I think, yes, there would be a potential risk for that. Thank you for bringing that up. I will explore that more. Thank you for your question. Dr. George, did you have another question? Okay. Sorry, uh, sorry, Dr. George, I see somebody at the back that had their hand up, so oh, maybe give them the opportunity. All right. Fabulous question. So, sorry, you have to repeat that. <laughs> sorry. Um, so uh, that's okay. <laughs> uh, so I, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so my understanding of the question was we were wondering about the impact of dissolved organic carbon on on mercury release. And what? Yeah. And it, yeah, if increases in dissolved organic carbon might have an impact on, on release of mercury in the system. Great, thank you. Yes, fabulous question. Nova Scotia lakes are very dystrophic. And so in Southern Nova Scotia, we do have a lot of brown water. So yes, absolutely. There would be an impact to the mercury movement and mobility from DOC and accumulation and methylation. And we do measure DOC during our experiments. And we see if the treatment may be reducing the mobility of DOC through the leachate and accumulation. And so I will add that to the list of the water quality parameters. Uh, but interpreting it uh, and the impact into this complex ecosystem, we have to take a closer look at the data to be able to say that. Um, the mercury also has sulfur as well. We have iron. And we are in a low oxygen environment. And so all of them are important factors for mercury methylation. And the lakes tend to be low in pH as well. And so that's another factor at play. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to uh, take that apart into discrete units and trying to understand the role of each of them. Yeah. That's an important but hard question to answer. <laughs> Thank you for your question. All right, Dr. George, your question. Are you sure? Okay, Dr. Lindsay, another one. I'm just curious about the safety of dealing with the opportunity for. All right, the question was about how the mining companies that are operating and developing new uh, developments in the area, how their work intersects with the legacy waste and how they navigate the liability issues associated with that legacy waste in their waste management. Is that fair? Okay. It's quite a complex question. We're talking about policy. We're talking about decision making. I'll try to uh, synthesize something uh, in a more uh, brief and uh, response. So first of all, the modern mining corporations are extracting gold from low grade ore. 
and they're managing the tailings of their property as part of their environmental review process. And so, but the second thing is for the historical tailings, yes, there's a lot of valuable elements in the tailings. And it's already been, I guess you could say, pre-prepared, ready to go for somebody to extract. There is a lot of interest of that. And there's corporations globally who are interested and have discussions about the possibility to re-mine the tailings. And it includes one corporation that was in the 1980s. And they did do a few initial tests to see if they could extract gold. Yeah, it was 1980s. But that time, the price of gold wasn't high enough to warrant its you know, continuation, so they went bust. The reported data, though, it looks like it is worthwhile. Now looking at the price of gold, it skyrocketed. It makes it more of a profitable endeavor. So we could do that alongside remediation approaches. However, a lot of corporations have a profit aspect to their business, and the government is considering how to manage that as well. That's a conversation that's still ongoing, but it is a conversation that's happening. And then when we're looking at, I'm sorry, I'm the second part of your question. I'm just looking at my transcript. So there's two large remediation plans for the two biggest historical mining sites in Nova Scotia. We have Goldenville and Montague. The government has agreed to about $48, $43 million to remediate these two sites. To be honest, it's not enough money at all, not even close. And they were supposed to start this work of remediation two years ago. COVID, of course, didn't help the situation and cause delays, but it is such a complex issue, especially for the wetlands that are at these sites. They haven't been able to even know how to prepare those sites. They're working on that right now though. And then at the other site in Goldenville, they're starting soon for investigating how to do a proper closure of the area. But those are ongoing work, but we're talking about two sites out of 300 tailing sites in the province. And not only that, but not all of them and all of these tailings are on crown land. A lot of them are on private property. And then, so who is liable for that then now? So there's a lot of things that need to be resolved from a legal perspective before you're even able to just even start the reme remediation process. So that's one reason why we're working on the wetlands and the treatment that we're talking about is the idea being is a simple direct and remediation approach that can be done on private property, it can be done on crown land, that's easy and that it stays in situ for at least a good length of time. The tailings are mobile, they're moving down into the ocean and almost all of our lakes in Nova Scotia do connect to the ocean. And so we also already have had shellfish closures in Nova Scotia and they're shut down because of the tailings. And not just arsenic venti, but also other types of arsenic that are problems in those uh, shellfish. So very highly contaminated. The scope of the issue requires private businesses, academia, government, everybody, multiple prongs and multiple partners working together on this. Thank you for your question. Right? Joining us today, Dr. Campbell, we all sincerely appreciate uh, both of your talks. They were just outstanding. And I think uh, for those of us who've had the pleasure to listen to both, uh, so many takeaways, uh, and also from the audience, not only here, but uh, on Zoom as well. Uh, I know that um, we've learned a lot from your expertise and time, and we appreciate that you've traveled this far as well uh, to be with us. Uh, and so we just have a small present for you. <laughs> oh, thank you. And uh, we hope that um, you'll enjoy the rest of your time in Saskatoon. Uh, and of course, keep in touch with us uh, as we uh, look forward to learning more about your work. As Absolutely, for sure. Yeah. All right, thank you. And thank you so much for having me here. It was very exciting for me to come to Saskatchewan after COVID and everything to actually see people in 3D and not on Zoom. Well, like, I'm, I'm sorry, there are Zoom people on the call. I, I don't mean to do that, but thank you for the people that were able to come in person. And thank you for the invitation to come and talk today. <laughs>